This is Radio 3, and now it's time for Mixing It. In tonight's programme, the presenters Mark Russell and Robert Sandal interview Brian Eno in his studio and find out why he thinks his latest project, Generative Music 1, which was made using a computer system that gives composers the chance to record music that will sound different each time it's played, marks the start of a change in the way all music will be created and listened to in the future. Brian, how did you discover generative music? How did it, how did it come to you? Well, it's, it's quite a long story. It's a personal story and a co cultural story as well. In the 60s, when what was called the new tonalism appeared, a lot of that was actually linked to new ideas about what a composer did and what the job of a composer was. And several of those composers were working with what I would call generative systems. Terry Riley's In C, which was one of the seminal pieces of that time, is a piece of music that has, I think, 53 bars in the key of C. And the instruction to the musicians is work your way through the bars at any speed you wish. So if you, if you particularly like bar 11, you can play it 50 times. Then bar 12, you can play once, bar 13, four times, and so on. But the, the important point is that each musician moves through that piece at their own speed so that at any given moment you're hearing a cluster of different bars of that piece of music being played simultaneously. So it's in the nature of that piece that it's unpredictable. It's sort of what I mean by generative, that you set in place a set of seeds um, which are then grown during the performance. You, you could never describe fully a version of in C and say this was what that piece sounded like. It changes every time. At the same time, there was a movement in the scientific community towards the idea of creating rule-based structures, which is to say the idea had occurred to a lot of people independently in lots of different sciences that the complexity that we see around us is not the result of complex initial conditions, but the result of the interaction of simple initial conditions. And this was what I wanted to do musically. I wanted to see a way of setting up systems that, that generated music for me, that produced music. But I didn't want it just to sound like boring computer music. I wanted to get music that I liked out of this. Now, my first attempts at this were discrete music, music for airports, those things that became called ambient music. They were all the products of numerical or physical systems that I had set up which I then allowed to play, to play themselves, and I recorded part of the output of them. And that recording is what became the record in those cases. Unfortunately, when it becomes a record, I thought it's rather a shame that you actually hear the same little segment over and over again. And I always thought I'd much rather sell the, the process, you know, so that you at home, instead of putting on the same piece of music over and over, would. Um, switch something on that started making a version of that piece of music but not an identical one. There are lots of ramifications of, of this. I mean, people listening to their favourite record um, and they get used to a performance or, you know, a composition. Mm -hmm. They sort of look forward to particular bits, how oh, I really like this bit, but we're sitting in front of your computer system at, as we speak and I imagine that every performance of each piece is different. Is that right? Yes, it is different. I mean, it, it really is something new in the sense of Yes, you will lose that special character that records have of being precisely the same every time. I mean, I, I always think that records are actually more like paintings than, than like anything else that happened in music before records, in the sense that a painting is exactly the same every time you go to it. This is an entirely new idea in music, new for the last hundred years, I should say. I don't think that this will replace records, by the way. I, I don't think that, you know, generative music comes along, suddenly everyone throws away their CD collections. In culture, old ideas never disappear. New ones just get added to them. And I think this is what will happen here, that, that uh, this new uh, little region of music will grow to take up quite a big space, I think. One more thing I should say about this is that I can see the possibility of interesting hybrids of this. For example, I could, I could imagine in five, eight years' time that you don't have something that's simply a CD player. You have something that's part CD player, part computer. And the CD you put in 
consists partly of pre-recorded fixed material and partly of instructions to the computer about how to generate new material. So what you get is something that's partly a record as we know it and partly a generative piece of music. And I mean, this is certainly going to be the interesting place to be, I think, in a few years' time. Aside from its, uh, the, the obvious portability and saleability of this idea, Brian, what advantages, you, you were talking about um, Terry Riley's In C earlier, what advantages does, does a software program have over a group of musicians, given those kind of random instructions that Terry Riley gave? Well, I think it has some advantages and several disadvantages as well. The, the way I'm looking at this at the moment is saying, well, for 30,000 years or however long humans have been playing music, we had a situation of unique and unrepeatable musical events. Then we had the invention of recording, so we had a hundred years of precisely repeatable events. Well, this is a new stage in that you have something that borrows many of the conveniences and advantages that relate to records, namely it's portable, it's changeable, you can make choices about it. But on the other hand, it has something that previously only live performance had, which is that it changes all the time. So it has that good aspect of live performance, that it changes all the time. It has the good aspect of recordings, which is that you can have them at home, you can make choices about how and when you use them. Um, currently, it has a bottleneck as well. This is the disadvantage that I have to tell you about, which is that it, at the moment, is related to the sound card in a computer because basically that is what is being played. That's the source of the sounds you hear. Now, sound cards have evolved so far to satisfy fairly dismal needs like um, shoot 'em up video games and so on. So they're not highly evolved musical instruments yet. But I think if generative music becomes something that people recognize as a new composing area, then sound cards will catch up with it quickly enough. What about the sort of thing of ownership of music? I mean, that came up with samples. I mean, here, what you're doing is reordering bits of pre-composed music, isn't it? And what, what no, is... that isn't how this works. No. Um, to, to explain this simply, in, in the computer, there's a little synthesizer, basically. It's called a sound card. And what I do is provide sets of rules which tell the computer how to make that sound card work. Those sets of rules concern things like scales, uh, intervals, um, rhythms, timbres. There's 150 odd different rules. And all those templates are set up by the, the software designer? That's right, yes. So in systems that actually give you bits of music that you then reorder, there are some systems like that, the, the sort of whole question of ownership of music and royalties, you know, who actually has written the music? Is it the people who have designed the software or is it the people who have reordered the bits? These questions affect everyone now, <laughs> whatever you're doing. The questions of intellectual property are the most complicated questions of the moment because aside from the who did it aspect, the other part is the who owns it aspect. You know, if I produce a, a generative music program, um, I can give it a title, I can call it this piece of music or that piece of music. If I give it to somebody else, it then starts making music which I've never actually heard before. I, I may have specified it by giving certain sets of rules, but I've never specified it precisely. So does that piece of music belong to them or is it my music or who does it belong to? Is it anyone's, you know? Aside from these larger questions of ownership and authorship, Brian, in the kind of um, the internal workings of it. How do these different seeds actually interact with each other? I mean, are we getting something akin to the interaction of real musicians? I mean, what, what exactly is going on when these, as these things are <clears throat> growing and elaborating themselves? It's, it's a bit hard to demonstrate this without having somebody actually looking at the screen um, and seeing what I'm doing. But we'll yeah, have a go. files and... OK, I'm, I'm going to open a piece called Contra. This is a fairly simple piece in that it uses eight voices, which are in fact all the same sound. It's eight, it's for example, eight strings, you might say. Now, I can tell those things to behave in several different ways. This voice here, for example, is following that voice. 
but it's following it in some rather interesting ways. It's not just copying it exactly. What it's doing, it's following within the chord that I have specified. So when the first voice plays a note, the second voice will play a note simultaneously with it, but not necessarily the same note. It will be a note within the scale that I've specified. And here is the specified scale, okay? Now, any, any property in this is specified as a, as a probability. That's to say, I can make a musical scale which says, play the fifth very often, play the minor second very occasionally, um, play the minor third almost never, play the major third quite a lot, and so on and so on. And I can tailor an envelope of possibilities about the scale in that way. When you actually set these rules, mm -hmm. you, you are presumably, in the way of a composer, hearing something, are you? Or are you, are you being fairly random? Well, <laughs> with me, it's always a mixture of both. <laughs> um, what happens is that I, I think of an idea. I think, um, I wonder what would happen if you made one of these voices move in very large intervals and another one move in very small intervals. And then you tell two other voices to harmonize to them or something like that. So I set that up and try it out and it doesn't sound very good. So then I start tailoring it a little bit. One interesting thing about this is that it's a system that you can change as it works. Um, that's to say that you can... Uh, I'll just start this piece, by the way. We're just hearing four voices at the moment. You have a basic generating voice, um, which has been told the following things. It's been told, generate notes that are between two and eight seconds long. Um, leave a gap occasionally between four and 10 seconds long. Um, work round note 33 um, with a range of 24 notes. Uh, make phrases that are between four and 15 notes in length. Make gaps that are between one and uh, six notes in length. Um, so on. So there's a whole set of instructions about the way that that voice will, will actually uh, move. And then, of course, it's also constrained by the scale instructions that I mentioned earlier, by the harmony instructions, by the next note instructions, by the rhythm instructions, um, plus a lot of more minor rules. Um, this piece I often have playing for five or six hours at a time. I just absolutely love having it going on. And the rules in this piece are arranged in such a way that there is the possibility of rare and, and very exotic singularities happening. There's a basic generating voice here. There's a voice which follows it and harmonizes with it. Then there's two other voices which select parts of the history of the piece and reintroduce them later on in the piece. What does that mean, the history of the piece? They as if it were, remember the piece up to its current condition, and they can select back, for instance, 20 or 30 bars back, take a phrase from there and reintroduce it later on in the piece and make a loop of it, for example. Um, but, so there's two of those voices doing that, and they're both doing it in a different way, actually, <laughs> without getting too technical. So, so both of those voices are looking back at the history of the piece and taking themes and recombining them later on. I mean, looking at this on the screen, it looks remarkably similar to sort of uh, conventional uh, sequencer programs on computers. You've got a lot of the same um, sort of graphs and uh, controls. I is the only difference that the machine is generating it rather than you playing the notes in? The difference is that you don't know what the machine is going to generate. With a sequencer, you, you write it, you put the stuff in there, and it comes out pretty much as you expected, <laughs> at least that's what you hope for. With this thing, it's really rather different from that in that you don't really have a clear idea of what's going to come out. You, you know the kind of universe it's going to be in, but it will surprise you again and again. Is it possible, I mean, I, I suppose 
that some parts will appeal to you and indeed to everybody more than others. Is it possible to, to as it were, photograph those and, and make them repeat so that you can put together almost like a, the best bits from the package? We're just thinking about a way of doing this. Because all of these rules are probabilistic, each time you start a piece, it starts with a slightly different interpretation of the values of the rules. It's rather like each, each child you have will have a different combination of the genes from you and your wife. Each child will be recognizably linked to you, but each one will be different. Now, it might turn out that you particularly like one of those blends. And what I'm trying to do is to think of a way of having a freeze thing, rather like a snapshot, which says, okay, this particular version of the, of the, this particular mixture of the rules is one that I like, or I don't like, you know? And therefore, I hope to be able to make the thing evolvable from there, to, to say, yes, this is the right direction. So, so let's um, tighten the rule cluster a bit and stay in this universe. listening to this program and they think I really like this music how can I buy it how can they <laughs> well they, they can buy this they can buy the software for this to use it you have to have a computer which at the moment has to be a PC it isn't written for Mac yet you have to have in that computer a particular sound card that's all but you, have you to plug have... it into your hi-fi but you also have to have your set of instructions for Contra yeah, but you, you, get, you can buy those, yes. You buy a little um, floppy disk, and it has two things on it. It has the player, so that these programs will play, and it has 12 of my pieces, of which this is one. So does that mean that the person who buys this can actually modify your pieces? No, uh, they can't. In this version, they're not modifiable. Um, there's quite a lot of reasons for doing that. The first reason was because I wanted to introduce people to the idea that anyway, what, you, what you're getting is a self-modifying piece of music. Though there are 12 titles in this thing, of course, each one of them is infinitely long, so, so it's pretty good value. <laughs> um, we're now thinking about a future generation where, for instance, this thing I mentioned earlier of the snapshot, the freeze might be possible, or where you're able to make some quite major emotional changes to the piece. Now, the authoring tool is fairly complicated, and it has to be complicated if you want to make subtle music with it, you know. The big problem with interactivity that few people seem to have realized is that 
If everybody's going to be able to do it after three minutes, it probably isn't going to do anything very interesting. It's back to garbage in, garbage out. Yeah, right? that's right. It, it would just be simple choices. On the other hand, if you want to make something that is capable of making subtle and complex choices, then there's a learning curve associated with it. So we are now thinking of um, a way of navigating through the huge space of possibilities that this offers you, which would be a sort of evolutionary way of navigating, which is to say, suppose the thing generates a set of rules, or you buy a set of rules. Suppose you can then evolve it in the direction you want. You don't have to know how it's doing that, but you might say, okay, yeah, that's not bad, but I'd like it brighter. You have a fader that says denser or, or darker, brighter. Then you say, I'd like it uh, sparser. Okay, another fader that says sparser, denser. Now you can, as a user, you could move those faders. You wouldn't know what was actually going on within this program to create those changes. For instance, darker might be a whole collection of things like changing the harmonic structure, changing the timbre, changing the mode that the thing is in, all of those things all at once. It would take you a month to learn how to do all of that and probably a lot longer to, to know wh what the differences were. So, so we think that there may be a way of making this an evolvable system. You've described this as, in, as you know, the future of music. How do you think it is actually going to take root in the culture, given that the music industry obviously are going to have enormous problems with it, you know, the, the mm -hmm. broadcasting of music in most places will equally not much care for this idea of things that don't repeat on an orderly basis. How do you see it, it making this, this sort of radical jump to the, the mainstream of people's thinking in the 21st century? Um, I can see two places where it's going to take root quickly. Um, and in fact, it already is, I believe. The first is CD-ROMs. Now here is an example of a medium completely without a message at the moment. CD-ROMs have been a huge failure, aesthetically, as far as I'm concerned. And it's partly because they've been used as playback devices, basically. A CD-ROM is, is, has been seen as a kind of glorious playback device, because we can play back text, we can play back video, and we can play back sound. The problem with using it as a playback device is that the only job the computer has to do is to juggle huge lumps of preformed data. And it doesn't do it very well. It's clumsy, awkward, there are terrible delays, and, and basically it's boring. After a while, you've seen what happens if you go through that door as opposed to that door. Yeah, it's like doing a crossword puzzle twice. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. It's exactly like that, yeah, or even ten times. <laughs> um, so uh, as soon as I started thinking about CD-ROMs, I thought, well, of course, what you need are systems that generate anew each time. So you, the, the thing that will solve the CD-ROM problem is using generative systems, not only um, sonic ones like this, but um, visual ones as well. And on that computer, I'm working on those, where in the same way you plant small seeds in the computer and it grows something. The something it grows has identity, just as this has identity each time I start it but it's different each time. Now, the great plus of doing this is that to, if you want to record this piece of music and put it on a CD, you would get an hour of it on there and it would be exactly the same hour every time you listen to it. If you put the seeds on there, the seed for this piece of music takes up about one sixty thousandth of the capacity of a CD-ROM. It's a minute just like a seed is minute compared to the tree that grows from it. Um, so you can have lots of these seeds, and they're very, very easy to access. The computer has no trouble getting to them immediately and actuating them immediately. So this, this is the first place. CD-ROMs are going to be using systems like this. The second, of course, is internet, World Wide Web and so on. The, the terrible problem with everything on the World Wide Web is this, it's crashingly boring waiting for it to download because you're downloading megabytes of material. So the technical optimists always say, oh, we'll have better phone lines and bigger computers and so on. I think the future there is that you download seeds. Now, of course, the real future is, that, is as I said earlier, the mixture of both. There are some things that are irreplaceably what they are. You know, you, 
you're not going to reconstruct Ray Charles's voice with a generative music program. Um, okay, so don't reconstruct his voice. Download that as an object, but um, create everything else around it generatively. Are we going to be seeing in the foreseeable future something like a generative U2 album? I mean, are there, for established creative artists, ones that you work with, are there applications of this that, that might sort of get out there in the foreseeable future? Yes, I think, well, one of the things that's been happening for the last 10 years or so is the remix movement, where people release a song and then 17 or 20 different versions of it come out. Now, this is a very interesting conceptual change, I think, because certainly when I started making records, there was this idea that you headed for the perfect mix and, you know, you spent hours and weeks in the studio getting this absolutely perfect singular form of something. Well, I think people more and more now think of a piece of music as a sort of space which you can move through in different ways. Uh, and which has many different um, interpretations and perspectives. And certainly the remix movement is an expression of this, where somebody does a record and then 20 versions of it are out within the month. Well, with this, this is a remix machine, basically. In suppose instead of making the definitive version of something and releasing it, and then other people getting the tapes and doing different versions of it, suppose you store the parts on a CD, in the case of U2, Bono's voice, Edge's guitar, well, a lot of the objects, actually. But the sequence and the order in which they happen, for instance, doesn't have to be stored. That can be regenerated. The, the precise lyrics can be regenerated. You know, there can be several streams of lyrics in there which can be reconnected together in new ways. I think for established bands, what you're going to see is a mixture of repeatable stuff that, like we're used to from records with newly generated stuff on top of it. There are interesting ideas in connection with uh, writing music for film and TV, for example. I mean, this could make a film composer's life a lot easier. I mean, if you could say to the computer, right, generate five minutes of chase music yeah. or generate five minutes of soft underscore, do you foresee that as a use? Yes, I do see that as a use. In fact, I think that's a major use of the thing. I think one of the things that's interesting is this next generation of this, where it's evolvable a little bit. So you could imagine somebody's making a film, they say, well, we want something that's dark and mysterious and strange or whatever. Okay, so you look through the file, here's the seed for dark and mysterious and strange. Plant that in the computer. It's okay, but it's not um, fast enough, okay? Speed it up a bit. It's, it's all right, but the darkness is a bit too gloomy. We want it dark and cold, okay? We want to empty it out a little. So I can, I can imagine a sort of tailoring process going on. But that has quite worrying ramifications, doesn't it? Because film executives might think, they might sort of think, oh, well, this is easy. We don't need a composer. We'll just do it ourselves. I mean, so in a way you might be sort of, or that kind of system might be doing musicians out of jobs, or does that mean that everyone is a musician? Well, people, these new technologies always have that ramification. In fact, they always do do some people out of jobs, but they also always create new jobs, um, new jobs that didn't exist before. You know, this is a sort of hyper-composing method, if you like. It won't make other composers redundant. Perhaps it will make some of the less interesting of them redundant, which perhaps we should be grateful for. <laughs> um, but, but it will create another kind of job. That there are people who will be able to compose with this who couldn't have done without this tool. For example, I, I'm the beneficiary of that kind of technological change. I, I couldn't have been a composer without the tape recorder. Everything I've done up until this depends entirely on the fact of tape recorders, on the fact of being able to build music up layer by layer, empirically, you know, to try something, see how it works with other things, to get rid of it, change it around. Well, sure enough, the tape recorder probably did make some people redundant. But actually, you could also say that it just exploded the music business anyway, you know, it, in, it just made it bigger, the whole thing. 
Presumably, were there, I mean, this is, we're deep into the realm of speculation here, but I know you're not, you don't mind that. <laughs> um, presumably, this does really take off. This is going to have a profound influence on the way musicians and instrumentalists actually play. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's going to, it, it, they will, it will force them in a way to loosen up their approach to, to performance. Well, I think it, it's, it's a very peculiar effect on musicians because you then start thinking of um, sort of parallel universes of playing. For example, if you were making a record with the thought in mind from the beginning, this is not going to become one definitive piece of music, but actually we're making a little universe of musical possibilities that will be reshuffled in ways which we can't even foresee. That is really something different, I think. That's quite a different... It, it's like making a grammar. Rather than making a, a, a paragraph or a novel, it's like making a whole grammar from which many, many novels will be written. It's a different idea. Brian Eno ending tonight's edition of Mixing It. The presenters were Mark Russell and Robert Sandal, and they'll be back next week with an all-CD edition. And you might like to know the programme will be at its usual time of 10.45 and back to its usual length of 45 minutes. The producer was Ekene Akalawu.